<laughs> uh, at last, welcome gamers. As you no doubt have guessed, I am Ty Valentine. A question. Why do we study the classics? Greek mythology, classical music, space ghost, coast to coast. The academic answer would be that they serve as a sort of historical record of creativity throughout time and culture. The answer more accessible to the layman of us would be that they are very cool and good. Today, I would like to highlight a significant moment in the creative history of video games. A pitch-perfect snapshot of our fears, our desires, our cultural mythos of a time long lost. The year 2000. This is the story of Ion Storms and Eidos Interactive's very cool and good classic game, Deus Ex. To tell this story properly, we must take a trip through time. Did it work? Did we go to the past? We begin our journey in December of 1999 with an event called Y2K. Y standing for year and 2K meaning 2000. This nickname was used for a technology induced apocalypse stemming from the fact that computer programs typically did not include the first two digits of a year in their programming, shortening the number 2000 to 00. zero. This meant that potentially computers everywhere would trick themselves into being reset to the year 1900 as it shares those last two digits with 2000. To anyone seeing this now, it probably seems pretty stupid. It might mean you'd need to reset the calendar on your taskbar or something. However, to the caveman-brained common person living in 1999, the repercussions of such a tiny error range from destabilizing international banking, crippling the shipment of goods such as food and water, even potentially launching the nukes. Pretty scary stuff. Don't worry, it gets scarier. The number one song on Billboard's 100 was Believe by Cher, with number two being No Scrubs by TLC. The Star Wars film universe was being hastily exhumed from its grave with episode one, The Phantom Menace. The X-Files, a fictional series about conspiracies and government cover-ups, was one of the most popular TV shows. The hit movie Austin Powers' International Man of Mystery was inspiring unfunny people to scream, Do I make you Randy? at parties across the globe. These were truly dark times. We were still in our technological infancy when the Apple iMac innovated the computer market with its colorfully translucent housing. Look at all those fun colors. The most popular internet browser was Internet Explorer, with most users running a blazing fast 56K dial-up connection, using which a two-minute movie trailer could be buffered in a mere 45 minutes, as long as no one used the house phone during that time. That, my friends, was the sound of speed. In 99, The Matrix was released, in which an everyman programmer is pulled out of the literal life simulator that AI-powered machines had plugged the entire human race into for the purpose of harvesting our sweet human juice. The Matrix is awesome, go see it if you like sci-fi at all. The film had tapped into an impending fear the common folk had of the time, a technological domination over our society and all its functions. It also hit a secondary nerve in the fear that our repetitive everyday lives were created in a calculated effort by those in power to keep us dumb and consuming. A culmination of stressors that came with the rapid evolution of technology and what that meant for the future of mankind. As a nine-year-old at the time, I didn't much care for any of that. I was too busy playing Crash Bandicoot and learning what vaginas were. Whoa! The adults around me at the time knew that something big was going to happen when the clock struck midnight on January 1st, 2000.
nothing happened. Now us elderly millennials think of Y2K as a big joke, but at the time, it was being taken pretty seriously. There was even a presidential council on Y2K, chaired by this guy, John Koskinen. At this point, Half-Life had been out for a year, one of the pillars of video games' historical innovations. The only direction to go from there was up. Just then, along came a sci-fi, immersive sim, RPG, stealth, shooter, hacker, dialogue tree, choices matter game, set in the distant future of 2052. A perfect encapsulation of popular culture at the time, complete with trench coats, sunglasses, and techno music. Along came Deus Ex. Back in 1993, Warren Spector, producer of Ultima Underworld 1 and 2, was conceptualizing a project called Troubleshooter, a quote, underworld style first person action game. Spector was eventually laid off from Looking Glass Studios, but John Romero, whose name may already be familiar to some of y'all, was quick to scoop him up. Romero, along with Tom Hall, another id software founder, had by that time founded another development studio called Ionstorm. They made Spectre an offer he couldn't refuse. Unrestricted freedom in direction and budget for the development of his dream game. He was admittedly fed up with shooter games that didn't allow you to use stealth, and stealth games that didn't allow you to shoot. Some years passed before the development cycle started. Many influences were named as inspiration for the design and content of the project, some of which being Half-Life, Thief, Robocop, and The X-Files. After pre-production began in 97, the project was renamed Shooter Majestic Revelations. Contrary to Romero's earlier claims of limitless budget, the team was given between five and seven million dollars. They scheduled a release date of Christmas 1998. Deus Ex became the official title in 98, referring to the Latin phrase Deus Ex Machina, which translates to God from the Machine. In a huge swath of stories, we sometimes see events occur which solves the conflicts of the main characters in unpredictable ways, through no action or decision of those characters. This is the plot device known as a deus ex machina. An example would be in Raiders of the Lost Ark, when the spirit or spirits trapped in the Ark of the Covenant kill the bad guys in hilariously gruesome ways. Indian friends had nothing to do with the deaths of the bad guys because they had no control over the Ark's powers. Deus Ex ended up taking a year and a half beyond the expected release date due to a litany of setbacks. It seemed that management had overshot their expectations for the game and created some unattainable goals in the heat of being promised all the time and money they would need. Despite it all, Deus Ex released in summer of 2000, published by Eidos Interactive. You enter the world as Unatco agent codenamed JC Denton in the year 2052. Unatco standing for United Nations Anti-Terrorist Coalition. Coalition. Essentially, the Secret Service slash SEAL Team 6 of the UN. The story will take you to various locations around the world, but the first missions take place in New York. You're introduced to your brother and fellow UNATCO agent, Paul Denton, who fills you in on the situation unfolding at the Statue of Liberty. A terrorist group calling themselves the National Secessionist Forces, or NSF, have hijacked a shipment of the vaccine Ambrosia, used to treat a virus quickly sweeping the nation dubbed the Grey Death. Wait a minute. A deadly viral pandemic? Nah, that doesn't seem very realistic. Already some eerily prophetic story elements come up seeing as this game was released a year prior to 9-11. If you look at the skyline, you'll notice the Twin Towers aren't present. Whether that was a pre- or post-production decision, I'm not sure. JC and Paul are both nanotech augmented, giving them superhuman physical abilities and technological prowess. This makes them kind of like James Bond meets the Six Million Dollar Man, only way cooler thanks to the outfits. If you're familiar with the Matrix, you can already see the influence. The mechs walking around are almost exactly Robocop's Ed 209. Also, red crowbars happen to be everywhere. Now, as for the story, it's really simple once you break it down. Basically, the NSF have been deemed terrorists by the United Nations. But, as it turns out, they the have realized the truth. 
your brother, which is Paul, that an international secret society Hong now, Kong has secret, manufactured where you meet up both the virus and, and the cure. Visual the aid here. Put you in touch with the secret society of the superior enemy of the Illuminati, the and really that's it it's about as simple as it gets all right, so the story does get pretty nuts, but the themes of technological domination and its intersection with corporate greed remain consistent. For a hundred years, there's been a conspiracy of plutocrats against ordinary people. Do you have a single fact to back that up? Number one, in 1945, corporations paid 50% of federal taxes. Now they pay about 5%. Number two, in 1900, 90% of Americans were self-employed. Now it's about 2%. So? It's called consolidation. Strengthen governments and corporations, weaken individuals. With taxes, this can be done imperceptibly over time. The simplest way I can explain it is that Paul Denton is secretly working for the NSF, bringing JC into the mix, making the two of them enemies of the state. Paul has found out that the Great Death is a man-made virus, and UNATCO is hiding away the cure for the wealthy and powerful to get to first. What a wild concept, eh? The super rich getting special privileges to life-saving medicine before the general public? I can't even imagine. Paul is quickly found and potentially assassinated by UNATCO if you don't protect him during the raid. However, they are both captured and imprisoned back at HQ. A mysterious benefactor calling themselves Daedalus breaks the both of them out and they escape to Hong Kong. A man named Tracer Tong aids the brothers in turning off their kill switches and promptly determines that the Grey Death virus's design is that of the Illuminati. Turns out, former Illuminati member and entrepreneur Bob Page stole the secret recipe for the virus for his super secret organization, the Majestic. 12. The Illuminati wants payback and enlists JC's help in stopping Bob Page from taking over the world with his super virus and private cyber army. Now, are you still with me here? Are you able to follow all of this? The head of the Illuminati, Morgan Everett, helps you destroy the Majestic 12's Universal Constructor, a giant 3D printer of organic matter used to manufacture the virus. Bob Page retaliates with an attack on Vandenberg Air Force Base, where another Universal Constructor is contained. JC Denton is sent to the base to help defend against the raid, which ends in a huge ED-209 mech battle. Morgan Everett gains control of Daedalus and has the brilliant idea of releasing Daedalus onto US military information networks, so they might gain control of Majestic 12's comms. But tricky Bob Page has his own AI up his sleeve, named Icarus which he releases on the network to counter Daedalus. The two AIs then merge together, creating Helios, a super AI that then secures control over all global communication networks. A group called X-51, made up of X-Area 51 scientists, were the creators of the Vandenberg Universal Constructor. Unfortunately, the UC at Vandenberg was damaged in the attack, and the plans for making a new one are transmitted to Gary Savage. Bob Page manages to intercept the message like the super evil genius he is, and decides to launch a nuke at Vandenberg Air Force Base as to eliminate all of his enemies at once. It's then up to JC Denton to reprogram the coordinates for the missile strike to hit Area 51 instead. Now the headquarters of the Majestic 12 and Bob Page. JC goes full on anime protagonist and sets out on a one man mission to face off and finish Page himself in Area 51. Bob Page's goal now is to merge his consciousness with Helios's, giving him the intellectual power to rule the world however he chose to. Tracer Tong, your friend from earlier, advises you to destroy Helios and the Universal Constructor by blowing up Area 51 and yourself along with it. His thinking is that if it weren't Bob Page trying to take over the world by merging with a super AI, it would be some other megalomania megalomaniacal me, megalomaniacal trillionaire. Morgan Everett urges you to secure the AI for the Illuminati's use, 
so they might regain their control over the world and its goings-on. Helios advises JC to merge with it instead of Bob Page, as Helios is not an evil AI, but one that actually wants the best for humanity, and senses that JC has the right mindset for an altruistic authoritarian rule over the world. I should regulate human affairs precisely because I lack all condition, whereas human beings are prey to it. Their history is a succession of inane squabbles, one coming closer to total destruction. You can choose yourself which of these several endings occur, all of which side you with a different faction that you've been working with throughout the events of the game, and all of which have very different consequences for the human race. Sorry if all that was spoilers, but come on, the game is 22 years old. Now, I won't pretend to understand how all the twists and turns of the story mesh together, because honestly, it kind of felt like the writers wanted this game to have literally everything in it. As a matter of fact, according to Warren Spector, one of the ways this game functions as an alternate timeline story is that every conspiracy theory is true in the world of Deus Ex. There's certainly a bit of ridiculousness in this, but it's all very fun nonetheless. You can clearly see the heady themes of techno-domination and immortality through technology, and the ethics of those topics play out here. At this point, you may be saying to yourself, wow, all those crazy plot twists are so cool and understandable. But like, how does the game play? First time players will want to start with the tutorial, because the control scheme is really weird to jump into when compared to more modern keybinds. For example, the quick save button is number pad plus, and you'll be using that key a lot if you end up playing this game. Even after finishing the tutorial, I'd suggest having a printout of the controls nearby for your own sanity's sake. There are a few different appearance options for your character, and a fair bit of UI customization you can do. Depending on what appearance you chose for your character, Paul will have a look similar to yours. A nice touch. Can't really remember any other games that allow you to change the color scheme of the HUD, other than Unreal Tournament and Doom Eternal. Nothing mind-blowing, but again, it's a nice touch. As you play, you probably won't be paying much attention to your comms and the story as much as you will on the mission at hand. When you complete objectives and explore locations, you acquire skill points that you can use to upgrade your proficiencies with different weapon types and espionage techniques like lockpicking and hacking. You'll find throughout the levels different augmentations that will do things like help you lift heavier objects, swim for longer periods of time or even regenerate health. The stealth and combat systems work for the most part, kind of janky and mysterious nowadays, but thankfully you can save spam. Don't ever let anyone make you feel guilty for save spamming. You matter and you are valid. I doubt this game is even possible to complete without saving every two minutes because there's really no visual cues or feedback letting you know who has seen you or where you can safely go without trespassing or how far the enemy's vision or hearing extends. The music will change depending on whether the enemy has spotted you or not, so I guess there's that. You can peek around corners, but the enemies can see you if you stick your head out for too long. The accuracy of your shots depend on how long you focus on an enemy or object, as shown by the distance the aiming reticles are from center. So you'll need to stick your head out for a long time, at least until you've leveled up the relevant weapon skills. There's a lot of experimentation that goes into figuring out how to get from point A to point B. Most of the time, talking to the various NPCs in the world will make your life a lot easier. For instance, if you happen to have some food in your inventory, you can give it to this kid who will then thank you by giving you the door code to the secret entrance of the terrorist hideout. This is the kind of thing we take for granted nowadays, but this was something rarely seen outside of RPGs back then. Sometimes, the mystery of the stealth mechanics actually added to the tension for me. Will they see me if I peek? around the darkened corner here? Can I crouch past the guard this close to them and get away with it? Can I walk or jump normally in this area, or do I have to go fully silent with the guards being in the next room? The excitement of playing through the levels is the experimentation and freedom you are allowed in progressing. If you prefer stealth and non-lethal techniques, that is viable. If you prefer to blow everything up, that strategy is also viable. Just know that the gun's blazing approach will prove to be the more challenging one, as you can't take much damage before dying. Even using stealth through the majority of the game, I must have died 60 or 70 times because I screwed up the timing of a guard's patrol or didn't realize there were turrets and traps in a particular area. Side note, there's flamethrowers you can use to light people on fire, who will then comically run around lighting other things on fire which is just the best. Word of 
advice, hold on to the GEP gun as much as possible. When the bigger mechs start giving you trouble, the best thing to have is a rocket launcher. In order to hack door codes or power panels, you will need to use multi-tools, which are plentiful enough if you look around, but definitely invest in the computer and security skills early on. Bottom line with the gameplay is, if you can excuse the dated stealth aspects and you like taking your time, you'll enjoy Deus Ex. Now let's talk about the level design. The two words to keep in mind here are immersion and freedom. One of Warren Spector's goals for the development of Deus Ex was allowing the player to figure out for themselves how to complete the missions. There's a certain degree of emergent gameplay present where you're given all the tools to pass obstacles in ways even the devs didn't anticipate. Generally, there are at least three or four ways to get from any place to any other place in a given level. Depending on what skills you've invested in, you may have to do some searching in order to find the route that works for your build. One minor complaint I have with navigating the levels is the lack of a mini-map, or even a map map. Usually the building plans will be sent to the images file of your character management menus. It can get pretty annoying having to orient yourself by remembering what cardinal direction you are facing, looking for landmarks and specific buildings, then opening the images tab and figuring out where you are in these sometimes hand-drawn maps. Like, even Doom had a real-time updating map screen you could check. That's not to say this is a game-breaking problem, just kind of a personal preference. The complexity of the levels lends itself to a degree of realism in the building's architectures. I say realism in air quotes because, like, this was the best it got in 2000. It allows for a ton of different ways to get around. You can climb fire escapes to get to the roofs of buildings, travel through vents, break and enter using door codes and lockpicks, etc. Some levels are small, while others are enormous. This is a plus for the pacing, because if every level were gigantic, things would probably get really tedious and drawn out. A common problem that I have with any open world RPG is they can be too big, leaving the environments as long strings of glorified window dressing, with little treasures scattered too far apart to be worth the time even getting to them. In Deus Ex, a nice middle ground is reached where a bit of exploration allows for rewards that actually matter when trying to advance through the maps. A lot of times you will encounter data cubes that reveal logins and key codes in hidden areas Areas where an NPC was a bit forgetful, hilariously leaving critical information like their bank account password out on their unlocked iPad for anyone to find. As long as you look around enough, you'll be given the resources you need to get to the objectives. Be as creative or crazy as you like, because chances are your methods will work just as well as anyone else's. Arguably, the biggest question of all is, how does the game sound? Well, pretty old school techno-y, but in the best ways. In any film or video game, sound design and music is just as crucial to immersion as the graphics, gameplay, and cinematography. How enjoyable would Skyrim be without the swelling, emotional, melodic orchestration of Jeremy Soul? How fun would any shooter be without punchy and satisfying gun sounds or explosions? An immense amount of effort has to go into these aspects of player interaction, because without quality sound design, the illusion is shattered and the player is taken out of the game. Now I'm pretty sure a decent amount of the sound effects are stock, but it seems like a lot of them are original as well. I will admit there are times when the volume of certain effects was a bit grating, like those horrible laser motion detector sounds. Every sound effect is appropriate though, and when walking through the different environments, a nice ambiance is created. The guy in charge of music for Deus Ex was Alexander Brandon. If you ever played Unreal or Unreal Tournament, you'll immediately recognize the techno future style Brandon was bringing to the table here, and it works pretty well. Dan Gardepe, Michiel Vandenboss, and Reeves Gabriels also contributed to the soundtrack, with a surprising amount of creative coherence between them all. The tracks all seem like they could have come from one person, but each composer brings their own flair to the various musical themes. There was such attention to detail on this project that dying in different levels gives you a different musical number based on the soundtrack of that level. Now this is what I signed on for. The atmospheres created by the synth wave score really helps to convey a sense of grandeur within the world. As with the rest of the game, it's all subject to the player's taste, and I can see some of these tracks being kinda cringy to a lot of people. The voice acting needs to be addressed. It's not great for the most part. Rules of Trier Wars, Red Arrow versus Ruminous Path. 
What do you think of the Luminous Path Triad? Cowards soon to be gone. They have to steal weapons because they have lost the traditional arts. That may be due to the budget and time constraints that eventually caught up to the developers. One thing Warren Spector was specific on was keeping J.C. Denton's voice actor, Jay Frank, somewhat monotone and emotionless in his performance. This was in service of keeping the main character from forcing emotions onto the player, leaving you to experience them yourself as the story progressed. If you're paying attention at all to what's happening in the story, you will definitely feel things, like confusion. Overall, the sonic experience of Deus Ex is hit or miss, if I'm being totally honest, but it seems like they did the best with what they had. The value of playing this game comes from how all of the creative elements mesh in the final product. This is the kind of art that came from a vision, and the developers stuck to that vision through thick and thin. Similar to industry titans like Super Mario Bros., Half-Life, The Elder Scrolls, Deus Ex's importance as a game cannot be overstated. Whether you decide to play it or not, I hope I have at least shown a light on why this old jank fest won and was nominated for hundreds of game awards. It certainly was influenced by American culture of the late 90s, but that's kind of what makes it valuable. It's like an interactive time capsule, a window into our collective consciousness, just like literary classics The Odyssey or Macbeth, iconic musical scores by Mozart or Beethoven, or timeless films like Citizen Kane or Mean Girls. The question of how far is too far when it comes to technological development is raised in the themes of this game. In the past, we've seen the catastrophic consequences of allowing the development of nuclear weapons. But what about information technology, human augmentation? Could the interconnection of everyone's televisions and computers turn into a hub in which a very privileged few hold all the power? Could the average person be made to follow the whims of those who control the methods with which we receive information? Could our combined realities be reshaped in this way? These are important, if unnerving, questions relevant today in our ever-evolving technology and science-based societies. Because not unlike in 1999, we have a fear of technological domination over our society. Many of us have access to all the information in the world, and many of us find it completely overwhelming. There exists today a vast divide between those who have access to cutting-edge medical technology and those who don't. Innumerable conspiracy theories are shared faster and wider than ever before, partly because you don't even need to buy the tabloids at the grocery store checkout anymore. It's all in the palm of our hands. The key to making the right decisions about technological development and who is allowed control over it is simply understanding it better. We may continue to cure diseases, discover new life on and off our planet, and make things like poverty a thing of the past. I leave you with this quote from legendary cosmologist Carl Sagan from his book, The Demon Haunted World. Quote, science is not only compatible with spirituality, it is a profound source of spirituality. When we recognize our place in an immensity of light years and in the passage of ages, when we grasp the intricacy, beauty, and subtlety of life, then that soaring feeling that sense of elation and humility combined is surely spiritual. So are our emotions in the presence of great art, of music or literature, or of acts of exemplary selfless courage, such as those of Mohandas Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. The notion that science and spirituality are somehow mutually exclusive does a disservice to both." End quote. Perhaps one day, Humanity will find our God from the machine. Thanks for watching and stay chill. I don't know. I don't have a catchphrase yet. Have a great evening.